second seminar convened by the new Centre for the Study of Popular Music and Popular Culture at UL, and you're very welcome to the seminar this afternoon. Uh, we will be formally launching the Centre later this semester, and we'll have more detail on the overall scope of the Centre. As Aileen Delan said last week, there are quite a number of pillars in the Centre focusing on different research strands across sociology, cultural studies, music, languages, music industries, and so on. So we look forward to revealing more about the Centre as we go along. Um, I'm particularly delighted today to welcome back a good friend of ours, um, uh, Melissa Hidalgo. And Melissa has, uh, it's really welcome home, M Melissa, to UL. Um, our initial contact came about in a very strange kind of way. I was in LA in 2014, talking on the radio on a, on a Smith's show about research, a research interest that I had, and Melissa, Melissa was listening, and we made contact, and we started chatting, and then we started working on a paper together, and then Melissa applied um, to come to UL as a Fulbright. So she came to the Department of Sociology, to the faculty of HSS, as our first uh, Fulbright, and spent some time with us here, and it was a very productive time. Your book was published. Um, uh, you contributed lots to uh, undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. And I think most importantly of all, you became a really good friend of Aileen and of Martin and myself and of colleagues in the department and in the wider uh, faculty. So I'm, I'm particularly thrilled and delighted that you could visit us today uh, on the kind of post UCC uh, conference <laughs> leg. So uh, over to you, Melissa, and you're more than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. My friends, so it feels nice to be back here at UL. Um, and <clears throat> I would say that this research actually also had uh, some roots from when I was here five years ago now, I can't believe it, like five years to the month, five years to the week that I left. Um, but I'll also say that this research, the seeds were planted maybe 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate student. Um, so this, is, this research has been a long time uh, forming. It's new as far as a new project for me, um, but it's, it's also, it's sort of been deeply seeded in me for a long time and is now I think ready to sprout thanks to um, the time I did have here on the ground and really thinking more about these connections between Irish-Mexican, Irish-Chicano, Irish uh, Mexican-American cultures, literatures, and convergences, right? So uh, once again, I just want to thank my colleagues. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and I'm very happy to be here at the Center for Popular Music and Popular Culture. Um, this, this goes back, so the, the seminar, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, it's gonna, it's a literary, I'm looking at literature, I'm looking at poetry in particular, um, which is a little different from the pop music, Morrissey Smith stuff I was looking at last time. Uh, but the Irish connections are there, and that's what I want to draw out for us today. Um, so th what I'm going to explore today are uh, the examples of transnational solidarities and literary and cultural kinships that align the ancient pre-conquest geographies of Ireland and northern Mexico or the southwestern United States uh, as we know it today. So I'm going to explore the work of the Chicano poet Alfred Arteaga, in order to highlight some of these ongoing connections between Irish, Mexican, and Irish and Chicano literature and culture. So who is Alfred Arteaga? Well, he is a Chicano poet. He's known, he's been called a poet of border crossings and porter, uh, poet of revolt. And this is another reason why I was drawn to him as an undergraduate student. He was a, he was a poet, writer, and professor born in East Los Angeles in 1950. He grew up in a city called Montebello, which is a city that borders East LA and where I was born. And he also grew up in a city called Whittier, further east of LA and where I live now. So I feel in some ways, even though I never met Alfred Arteaga, I feel like he's kind of like a spiritual elder, like a tío, like an uncle whose footsteps, uh, I feel like you know, I'm following him. He sort of paved a path for, for us who are interested in these convergences. Um, he's also a child or a product of uh, the Chicano moratorium, the Chicano rights era. So to review briefly, uh, like a lot of parts of the world in the late 1960s, early 70s, Chicanos uh, as well um, were protesting for their civil rights, right? Walking out of their high schools, protesting their substandard conditions in all kinds of ways. And it really, the movement really kind of converged uh, in this moment called the Chicano moratorium 
which was a specifically an anti-Vietnam War protest. And Chicanos were protesting the high numbers of Chicano men who were being drafted into the war and who were dying at out-proportion numbers in the war than, uh, you know, than they were actually coming back to, you know, alive. So there was a big uh, protest called the Chicano Moratorium, and Alfred Arteaga was a young student at East Los Angeles College at the time covering this uh, for the local uh, radical newspaper called the LA Free Press. So he was really politicized too during this moment, and, and we see that then later in his poetry, uh, a little bit later on. <clears throat> the book, though, or the collection I'm going to be looking at today, um, it's, it's, it's a collection called Chican Cuicatl. You know, it's a, it's a hard word to pronounce because it's Nahua. It's coming from the ancient indigenous language in Mexico, pre-conquest. And so this collection called Chican, Chican Cuicatl, uh, it actually is it's a collection of all of his works, including a posthumously um, published work of poetry. Uh, he passed away in 2008. Or, um, yeah, 2008, and then his last work was published later that year. So this collection was brought together um, by a professor, Dr. David Lloyd, who also happened to be my undergraduate in instructor at Berkeley back in the 90s, and this is also where I first encountered Arteaga's work. And incidentally, this Irish professor was also responsible for introducing me to the very first time to work by Chicana lesbian poets, Sheri Moraga and Gore Ansaldua. So again, these convergences are happening, happening for me at a very young age, not quite sure what to do with it at that point, and I'm not sure what to do with it now, but I know that there's something there that I'm, that I'm latching on to. Um, and so the work I'll be looking at today is, 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 is his very first work called Cantos, which is de his debut poetry set. And I'll also be looking um, at a collection that he published in 1997 called The House with the Blue Bed. Um, so to, to talk a little bit about um, sort of what I'm drawn to around uh, the themes around his poetry, around Arteaga's poetry, is that his work is a reflection of the transnational, transcontinental movements, poetic crossings. Uh, he's interested in mapping. And he has a term called dislocasia that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. But it's, it's essentially this feeling of being displaced through time and space because of, you know, of not belonging, right? Um, so I take these, these entries, I take these uh, themes as entries into this exploration. But another context is, again, David Lloyd's own work. So if David Lloyd was the professor at Berkeley who was teaching Alfred Arteaga and this poet, David Lloyd was also a really big advocate for Arteaga because Arteaga was going through a tenure battle at, at Berkeley that he actually had to sue UC Berkeley for. Um, and that was a whole big mess, but Lloyd was a really big advocate, and so when he passed, when Arteaga passed away, Lloyd was entrusted with putting his collected works together. Um, but even back then in 1993, David Lloyd's book, where he basically thinks, he looks at Irish writing in the post-colonial moment, and is trying to look at Irish writing, canonical Irish writers, and he, he looks at four in particular, uh, Beckett, Yeats, Haney, and Joyce and he's trying to apprehend these writers as something other than writers that are concerned with Irish national identity, right? So what are the kinds of um, crossings, I guess, uh, can we think about? And so a quote I was drawn to in terms of how Lloyd is reading some of these Irish writers really kind of breaks open in the possibilities of these cross-border kinds of comparisons. And it's the quote that you see here where David Lloyd says that there have been continual transactions uh, between American minority writers and their Irish counterparts, while it is well known, as it is well known, the Northern Irish Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s took much of its style as well as its politics from the U.S. American Civil Rights campaigns. And in another quote, I don't have it up here, but there's another writer who writes in his introduction to the Wordsworth edition of Dubliners, uh, and he's a professor called Davies, and he also says, indeed, quote, indeed it is easier co to connect Joyce with writers in the Americas and continental Europe than it is with writers in Ireland. So again, just sort of positioning these Irish writers sort of outside of the national right is an important way of sort of breaking open these other kinds of uh, transactions as Lloyd calls them, right? And as for Arteaga in his own theoretics or his own theorizing of the Chicano and the Chicano hybrid, uh, just as a quick review uh, for those of you who might have remembered what Chicano meant from last time, but shorthand uh, is a politicized term or political term for Mexican Americans. So Mexicans who were born on the U.S. side of the border may have parents or grandparent lineage in Mexico, 
But rather than call ourselves a Mexican American, which is a sort of you know a sort of mainstream assimilationist way of recognition, Chicano is a particularly um, political identity that really is grounded in uh, the indigenous aspect of identity and sort of really uh, trying to fight you know sort of uh, looking for Aslan or homeland uh, away from the kind of U.S. national conscription of, of that homeland. So this is what Aslan means. And so for Arteaga as well, the conversations ha can also happen when we think about the Chicano as a kind of hybrid figure, right? A border crossing figure. Um, the language of Aslan and of the borderlands is a site of confluence in the way that Chicano body is mestizo or a mix, right? And the homeland is international. The language is a hybrid. So I think these ideas of hybridity and border crossings are, are part of the framework where we see these Irish writers and Chicano writers having these conversations and, and sort of having it make sense in that way. So I'm gonna, the first set of poetry, I'm gonna look at two texts. Um, I'm gonna look at a couple of cantos uh, from his first collection. Cantos it basically means verse. Um, the, the word in Spanish means song or it can mean, you know, tell a story, you know, but cantos is like a verse. And it also kind of comes from the, during the Chicano movement, this kind of reaching back to a Flori Canto tradition, which is a Nahua indigenous storytelling tradition. So this is also what Cantos is trying to refer to. So, Lord, um, so there, there are three kind of Irish references that I'm gonna look at and, and talk a little bit about today. But a Canto is a form of Chicano verse that recalls the Floricanto tradition of the Nahua tribe and its descendants. This is Moraga's uh, explanation. Lloyd calls Arteago's can Cantos a precocious and ambitious first collection that nods to epic poem traditions that include Dante, Pound, and Neruda, and even John Donne and Sor Juana, so these poets going back to the 1700s. Uh, these poems are hybrid in subjectivity and they're interlingual and multilingual plays in English, Spanish, Chicano Spanglish, uh, French, German, and Nahua. So again, as, as a poet, Arteaga is really trying to experiment here with language and hybridity. So his debut poetry collection, Cantos, opens with four verses that narrate European conquest and colonization of the American continent from the birth of the ancient civilizations and arrival of the Spaniards to the creation of the modern day California Chicano Barrio, circa 1986. Three, what's fascinating to me about this is that three of these opening verses, so if there are four opening cantos that narrate this history of conquest, three of the four mention Ireland somehow, <laughs> right? They have references to Ireland, so I'm like, hmm, what's going on there? What do these references to Ireland have to do with the creation of you know, a new world, right? Mexico, so to speak. And <clears throat> there, there, so in the, the Irish references continue in the later work I'll be looking at today called House with the Blue Bed. While he's looking at, he's living in County Sligo at the time and writing about Belfast. So again, Ireland um, really kind of plays into his work. As for Cantos, uh, the first connection um, the very first canto, at the end of the very first canto of this four, ends with the famous words that Molly Bloom said, okay? So I'm gonna have you just kinda hold on to this image for a second, because the next slide is where I'm gonna do the text reading, but just to show you the images, I, I couldn't help but put these two together because, well, Arteaga kind of, you know, did that work already. Uh, the photo on the left is an image of, um, by a Mexican painter called Antonio Ruiz, and it's called El Sueño de la Malinche, or Malinche's Dream, that was painted in 1939. And I just want you to notice the, the, her, the, her, her body, how her body is figured as Tenochtitlan, or which, which was the capital, the ancient capital of Mexico, that uh, Aztec capital, that now current day Mexico City was built on. Okay, so when we're talking about Tenochtitlan, we're also sort of talking about present day Mexico City and the ways in which women's bodies were often figured as landscapes, right? And then we have been juxtaposed with an actress. Hi, help me, my Irish friends. How do you pronounce that first name? Is it Carrie O'Brien? C-A-R-A-I-D. How do I say that I name? Carrid. Huh? Carrid? Carrid? Yeah. So this is actress. Is, uh, she, play, she performs Molly Bloom's complete monologue every Bloom's Day on the radio. So I really love the two women slumbering in bed, sort of, you know, this invitation again to their bodies. So to have this image in mind then, as we go to this one, this is a primero canto. 
So the first canto, which, which is the arrival, so the arrival of the Spaniards that um, Arteaga is imagining in this poem, this is um, the last part of that. So we can begin with um, the selection I have here. So feminine a shape, so female a bay, another shape, gliding birds, another touching trees, true name of woman, Vera Cruz, body of woman. He named me Chochitepec, so yes, we are all flowers of the mountain, all a woman's body, that was one true thing he said in life. Above birds, leaves, above so women of form. Las quince letras, not the seven words, contestó malincín, yes, I said yes, I will yes. So the imagery of the body, again, just recall it here, right? Veracruz is a city in Mexico on the Gulf Bay, on the Gulf side, where the Spaniards first landed, <laughs> essentially, and the slave trade in Mexico also started in that area. So if they're coming in from Veracruz and then they're making their way inland toward where Mexico City would be now. So my first sort of reading of this um, was I, I found it really interesting as someone who studied uh, Ulysses um, as a master's student and was really fascinated with the Penelope episode at the end and the monologue and of course the only time we see a woman ha have any sort of agency or discussion about anything is at the very end um, in Ulysses and it's Penelope and of course her famous last words that end the novel, right? Yes, yes, I will, yes. So on the one hand we have to think, we have to remember that Malinche or the Malincin, um, also known as Doña Marina, she's sort of Mexico's Eve, meaning all the men in Mexico blame her for their, like, their downfall, right? Because of course it's always a woman's fault, right? Because the idea is that she slept with Hernán Cortés, the Spanish colonizer, and thus birthed a new people, Mexicans, Mexicas, Mestizas, right? The mix of Indio and European, uh, sort of is the origin story of Mexico. And, um, you know, the Octavio Paz, the Mexican writer Octavio Paz in Labyrinth of Solitude, very famously called Mexicans hijos de la chingadas, literally translated as sons of the fucked one. So guess who the fucked one was? It was Malinche. Now those of you who are soccer fans, and I know there's at least one soccer fan in this room, <laughs> who knows uh, about a Mexican football chant that uses a feminized you know, version of this word um, as a way to insult the goalie because he let it in. Okay, so there's a whole long history with this notion of Malinche being the traitor, being the Eve, you know, and all of that. Sleeping with the enemy, right? Sleeping with the conqueror. But when I read the words, you know, and you know, on the one hand, it is, this is a poetic rendering that Arteaga is doing. And while on the one hand, it's sort of not news, you know, for conquerors or for imperialists to figure land as a woman's body to sort of justify the conquering, right, and the pillaging of it. I didn't, I didn't necessarily read that in the poetry. What I did read, though, was an interesting, what I thought was, uh, and I'm still thinking through this, but in some ways I really think putting, Mali, uh, putting Molly Bloom's words into Malinche gives her a little bit more agency. Yes, yes, I will, right? Not, oh, he took me, but yes, I will. Like, hey, maybe I want to do this, right? And so it's an interesting kind of, I think, placement of these words. Um, Molly Bloom also then viewed as the traitor in some way because she cuckolds the hero by sleeping with Blazes Boylan, right? The good-looking man with the quiff. Uh, the, the, there he is airing his quiff, uh, sleeping with Blazes. So Molly is the traitor. So, you know, sort of on the textual level, it makes sense to sort of see that interplay. But in another way, I'm, I'm, I like to think of it as some sort of agency that Arteaga might be giving my lead scene at this end. So there's the sort of first uh, convergence, and it's interestingly that it sets up the poem. So remember, this is the end of the first canto. There are three left that come. So if we're seeing the first kind of Irish literary reference happening in a more, like a more contemporary Irish reference, we now go way back in time to the San Patricios, to 1847, which is the second kind of moment of Irishness in these poems. So. Just a reminder, or as a quick kind of recap, the San Patricios were the Irish-led battalion who fought, they were initially, as, as the story goes, they were initially in the U.S. Army, so they were Irish people that came from the fam, you know, famine migrants or, or emigrants, um, joined up with the U.S. Army, but at the time we know historically that there was lots of anti-Irish sentiment happening in the U.S., a lot of kind of no Irish need apply, that this goes back to the anti-Catholicism. So a good number of these Irish soldiers defected, although they didn't really defect because they weren't Americans either, but the U.S. Army thought of them as defectors. 
left to cross the border to fight uh, for Mexico against the very same U.S. Army that they left. And so the Patricio, the San Patricio Battalion, they fought in two important battles uh, that were kind of strategic as far as warding off the, the advances of the U.S. Army. One of them was at, uh, the, the, and the more famous battle is at Battle of Churubusco, which is the one up in the corner. The image on the bottom shows the hangings, and that, again, I'll go back to the other slide to, to detail that. And I just wanted to give you a present sense of the two battles that were being held. So if, we, if the two battles, uh, the San Patricios, were here, that Chapultepec, and then the second battle was here, this is what it looks like today in Mexico City, sort of the mapping of it. So to go back to the San Patricio, so the second, we have the third, the second canto, there's no Irish stuff in there, but the third canto and the fourth canto, we come back to it. The canto primer, so we have now the second, the viaje, which is the journey, okay? So we have sad, terror-laden, laden sea, bright heavens. Sorry, I'm going to, there it is. Uh, let's see, Bright Heavens to Canada, America, Churubusco, Chapultepec. Flight of John Riley, Harp of Aaron, a shamrock, a green field. Was it Colonel Bennett Riley or was it Captain O'Shea? 16 hanged at San Angel, April 9th, 1847. Four hanged at Michoacac, April 10th. 30 hanged at Chapultepec, Grasshopper Hill, where the children, took, children heroes took flight, April 13th. The rest, 50 lashes, an iron collar with three prongs six inches, eight pounds each, a head shaving, a D branded on the cheek. From Green Terra Island to Green Tenochtitlan Island, from Aaron to Aztlan, I remember them. So this poem, let's see, I'm trying to remember where it was here. Oh, I'm just gonna wing it. There it is. In his third canto, Alfred Arteaga recounts the mythologies surrounding the 1847 Battle of the San Patricios, the Irish Battalion fighting in Mexico against the U.S. from the flight of John Riley, who was like the head of the San Patricios, to the corporal punishment of his captured soldiers. So the first thing that jumps out at me are, are just the numbers and the actual, the violent punishments. These are the punishments that the U.S. Army then, um, the violent punishments that they meted out to the so-called Irish deserters when they were caught at Churubusco. And that's the hangings that you see um, depicted here. Well, interestingly, these, um, if you look at the footnotes for the back of the, of the poem in the, um, in the footnote section, that these descriptions here, Arteaga, um, they're based on the actual military newspaper that was published in 1848. So this is a US military's just cataloging of what was done and to the bodies as if, you know, checking off, we did this, we took care of that. The D uh, meant deserter, so they branded the D on the cheek. And these all actually happened to the San Patricios who were caught. Um, not a, only a handful of them survived, but most of them were killed or hanged or otherwise sentenced with the spikes through their neck and the branding and the, all of that, so very clearly punished. Um, but what I also, the other thing I also found really interesting about this is that if you didn't know what this was, like he doesn't, Arteaga nowhere here says the word San Patricio. Mm -hmm. He never says, um, the, you know, he doesn't ever mention the, the battle by name, right? So, and, you know, he never identifies even Ireland by name, right? The, the references there are to Aaron and Shamrock and Greenness and to the names, right? And then the, the battle, the Chapultepec and the, the Churubusco are the sites of the battles. And I read that as, you know, even though he never identifies as San Patricios or mentions Ireland by name, it's the poetic, the, the kind of pairing of, of Aaron and Terra, right? Uh, the alignment with Aslan and Tenochtitlan is where he's drawing these connections. So again, sort of beyond the national battle, beyond the national importance, he's getting at these mythologies and he's drawing these mythologies together. And it's, it's the interesting placement of Terra alongside in this last two, this is where the title of my paper comes from, this verse. <clears throat> the poetic placement of Terra and Aaron alongside Tenochtitlan and Aslan in this canto evoke a pre-conquest kinship between Ireland and Mexico before they were called Ireland and Mexico, right? So pre-conquest, or well, maybe Mexico was, but these are based on common histories, but meaning that Tenochtitlan and Aslan, right, before they were Mexico, just like Aaron and Terra, right, before Ireland, right? So Arteaga is really 
I think um, routing these connections through these mythological past, these ancient past, to say that we're actually connected before these imperialists came and told us who we were, right? So I really like that poetic placement, um, that, that linking of Terra to Denochtitlan, of Aaron to Aslan, really putting us together in these mythologies, in these ancient mythologies that go back to these civilizations before conquest. Let me show you that screen. And so again, just to kind of repeat that um, the, the, the basing of these mythologies and of these kinships alongside each other, um, Arteaga writes, quote, the Chicano hybrid thought allows for a movement among discourses that replicates the possible range of perspectives on race or the homeland. It readily permits a fluidity in conceiving race and homeland by treating these concepts as categories of concepts that are composed of multiple and conflicting texts. So there's already, too, that kind of multiple confliction that, that, that we see in sort of a hybrid state of things. And I just have this map up here because I think um, to, to see sort of, this map is an 1847 or an 1848 map, I think, that happened right before the border uh, came down to where it is now. The U.S.-Mexico border that we know now is the same border that was created in that war, in the War of 1847-1848. The signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is sort of what cemented the border and then the cession of the land. And so that's the border that we know now today. Um, and a map I found online of Aaron, again, it's an interesting sort of like a, this notion of, of the, these mythological homelands that are somehow connected through these histories. So then the third and final canto, or the third and final reference, if we move from the arrival to the journey, and now we're coming to a more contemporary notion of Chicanoness. And I translated the, so the very top, uh, Chronotop Chicano, I kind of roughly translate as like a Chicano time map or like a Chicano time <laughs> zone. Um, and then the third then, so we're, he's bringing us up to a more contemporary um, context. But the other, what's interesting here, and this is if we can just again read through the, uh, the, the text I have here for you. We have uh, Aguila Negra, Rojo Chante, Tinta y Pluma, Textos Vivos, Written People. The Vato with the Vida Loca on his neck, the Vata with PV, the Ganga with Tears, the Shining Cross, Vario Walls, Codices, Storefront Placasos, Vario Names, Desafios, People's Names, Written Cars, Names Etched in Glass, Land of a Thousand Dances, Placas in Love, Etched in Schools, Faces of Indians branded by Spaniards, faces of Irishmen branded by Americans, Gachupin, he who kicks with the boot, Yankee, new man of the new world, Yaquink, Chicano, cantador, namer, Chicanquicatu, Floricanto, canto, canta. He wrote this in Santa Cruz in 1986. So in, in this poem, there are a couple things I highlighted. The, what I see is interesting is the aligning, the poetic alignment of Indians with Irish, right, up and against the Spaniard and the Yankee. The word gachupin is a slang, uh, a slang that people in the Americas used, a, a disparaging word for the Spaniard, right, so the gachupin, again, the conqueror, or the European. So Arteaga is aligning Indians and Irish and Chicanos together in this poem, again, as sort of conquered, subjugated bodies, right? against the, the, up and against the, the conquerors, the Spaniards, the Yankee, the Gachupin. The Chicano then is a sort of natural uh, result of these alignments, of these historical alignments, and again, poetically being aligned and with the Irishman being part of this lineage is what Arteaga sets up for us. And it's, there's also very some specific East LA or Los Angeles placements happening here with the song, for example, called Land of a Thousand Dances. I'll play that for you later if you guys want to hear it, but I know a lot of you have heard it. Um, and it was first made famous by a Cannibal and the Headhunters, which was an East LA Chicano band. So that's why I can say that a lot of the, and sure, you know, there's Vida Loca and a lot of the kind of gang, barrio, um, you know, references that could happen in San Francisco or anywhere really where you have Chicanos and poverty. Um, but this is, I think, a specifically East LA placement that we also see Arteaga working with here and aligning these um, new identities, right? These new people that emerge uh, as a result of conquest. Right. So we move on then from Cantos, which is his first work, to his third work called The House with the Blue Bed. 
And from Berkeley to Belfast, Belfast or Ben Boldham, um, this little section I'm calling Mapping Dislocasia in the, ho the House with the Blue Bed. And David Lloyd uh, calls the House with the Blue Bed, quote, a receipt, French, a French word, or series of short and interconnected narratives that refuse chronological order and constitutes a deep reflection on temporality and displacement, unsettling autobiographical certainty and composing the narrator in a shifting field of interweaving stories that mingle memory and meditative digressions. So if Cantos was his first collection of poetry, this now is a collection of prose essays, but they're kind of disjointed and they refuse chronological order. So again, Arteaga is really playing with time and space here. And he, in some ways, he's kind of chronicling his own travels during this period in his life. He ends up, he's going from Berkeley, so that's the picture up there on the left, is, is the UC Berkeley campus, um, which I remember very well now looking at that photo. Um, and that, I believe, is actually Wheeler Hall, which is the English building, so that's what, where we would have been. Um, the second one is obviously a reference to Belfast and Bobby Sands and the Bobby Sands mural that's there. And then Ben Bolbin, which is the landmark in County Sligo that marked home for um, Arteaga when he was here. So the first little poem I'll look at, uh, which does some interesting mapping work. Um, and the mapping stuff will make a little bit more sense later, I hope, when I, when I talk about the term dislocasia and what that means. Uh, but a poem here, uh, this, this poem opens the collection. So it opens the House with the Blue Bed collection. Again, a very specifically um, Irish, Irish place here that he's playing with. Blood, sand, blood. And, and throughout the book, he's playing with ideas of blood and sand. A perfect walk up from the water around Mullockmore, little boats becoming more so, shrink in view than wait in memory behind the hill. Tomorrow, Bundoran or Lissadell, it makes such little difference, will walk about the same, and this bright light can neither repeat nor fade. Though pleasure craft may dis diminish and finally sink from view, though I sweat you slow, where the distant sinking spiry glow. So the underlying places in green are, are up along this coast here, in the Sligo coast. So he's, I'm reading this as a mapping now. In other words, if he's feeling lost and displaced from time, my sense is that his insistence on naming and mapping sort of is helping him find his ground. But beyond that, so we're looking at a map of um, northern part of Sligo, but with, so then we're going to talk about this term dislocasia because it kind of pulls us together. For Arteaga, dislocasia is an affliction he acquired while living in Westwood on a research fellowship at UCLA. So I was talking to my partner about this because, yeah, when you're from East LA and you go to the West Side, it's a whole different world. You might as well be in Sligo, for really. I mean, it's, it, it, it's the class difference, it's Hollywood and West LA and, you know, centers of power, the movie industry, versus the East LA Barrio, historically in Mexico, Boyle Heights, also named after an Irishman, by the way. Um, so it's interesting that Arteaga starts, you know, he's been in Berkeley, he's been in Texas, he's been everywhere, but he gets to Westwood and UCLA and he's like, where the heck am I? Like he's experiencing this deep sense of displacement. And it's a sense that follows him, right? And through it, throughout his whole work of poetry, he's really struggling with this. It's a disorientation, it's a sense of non-locatability and of being lost, more profound than merely spatial. It's a break in contiguity, a break in the sense of place. Brought up again when he remembers there are no hummingbirds in Ireland in a story called Flight. Um, he, there's this line where, you know, he, he, he's starting to feel like he's home in Sligo, and then he's remembering, you know, like something that reminds him of home, meaning the U.S. Southwest, or hummingbirds. And he's like, there are no hummingbirds in Ireland, and it kind of, you know, it messed with him a little bit. Um, but the conversation about borders, um, if he's displaced from time, and if the reason of dislocation is space were caused in the first instance from the flow of time, of, from flow of one time to another, what he's doing here, I think, um, is again trying to, to, to find ground. And so literally in the same poem, the poem where he's going halfway, this one. No, oh, it's another one, I'm sorry. There's another poem where he's talking about the sand, okay? And he's walking halfway between Strita and Mollabore. And he's in Galveston, Texas. He's in Galveston, Texas, where he's now being reminded of the sand in Sligo, 
And in Galveston, he's feeling displaced from Sligo, <laughs> right? So again, it's an interesting, like, it's like, even though he's closer to where he's at home in, in Texas, but halfway between this, this point and this point in, Sli in, in Sligo is, is, is Texas. But just so we get a sense, too, of the sand, we see uh, this is where Galveston, Texas is. It's a small island, and it's itself sort of displaced from the rest of Texas. And it's in this part. This is where Veracruz is, by the way, in the entry point. Whoops. So halfway between, he's finding his place in Texas, right? He's losing his place in Texas while trying to relocate himself in Sligo and vice versa, right? And it, it's this insistence on mapping, though, that I find really fascinating as a way to ground himself, okay? And last but not least, or almost last but not least, part of him grounding himself on the sand in, in Ireland um, he, he takes trips, he takes a lot of trips when he's here in Ireland, and one of the trips he makes um, is to go see the grave of Bobby Sands. So he's playing on this on the blood and sand again, right, trying to find something, right? Um, so moving from Galveston and Sligo and the mirror and the repetition that he's fading, and there are other images, right, that he's, that he's thinking through, and another image that comes to his mind right away is Bobby Sands. Okay, he's walking on the sand, He's, seeing, he's thinking now of Bobby Sands. And in, the, in the, the essay that we're in, the next sentence, we're with him in Belfast. So we literally go in one sentence from Galveston, Texas, another sentence to Sligo, another sentence back to Texas, and another sentence. So it's literally, when you're reading it, it's just a lot of like, we're all over the map, quite literally. And yet there's a weird sense of grounding, I think, that's happening there. So Sands dies on Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> in 1981, which is something that Arteaga also picks up on and is feeling this kinship with this Irish freedom fighter, right? Um, after the hunger strike for recognition as a political prisoner. So he's not a criminal, but he, he and the others were treated like one. So Sands and the other nine starve while the English and America media delighted in the story of a princess and prince and the ritual reproduction of a system of gene supremacy that the enlightened parts of the world cast off long ago. Here Arteaga is discussing the fact that while Bobby Sands is doing this hunger strike and these freedom fighters in Ireland are, are fighting and they're, you know, they're losing their battle, everywhere else we're worried about Prince Diana. Mm -hmm. And I remember this though too in the United States, that's all it was. It was like, I was like maybe in first or second grade, Lady Diane Prince, you know, it was this fairy tale. We didn't know anything else that was going on in this part of the world except for that damn wedding, right? And there's a part of me that wishes I knew this story instead, you know, because the royalty didn't do anything for it and they still don't, you know. But there is something that Arteaga also was, was being drawn to toward the story of um, Bobby Sands and sort of imagining the lived conditions of, and what he was going through uh, during his fight as a political prisoner. So how far do we go to find home? <laughs> Sometimes we have to go really far away to find home, right? Sometimes home is not something we can find until we leave it. And Arteaga, at the end, realizes that for himself. Um, the background photo I have here is Whittier Boulevard during the anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium that just happened uh, two years ago in 2020. Um, one thing Chicanos have contributed to humanity is a sense of border. We can walk and swim and get lost and find ourselves and make life there in zero time and chaos. I found that when I got here, right? Far away from home, the furthest, po I mean, the furthest I've ever lived. I went to school at UC Berkeley, but that's only six hours, seven hours from home. My mom, as far as my mom is concerned, I might as well have been in Ireland back then. <laughs> you know, but I'm like, Mom, I'm just up the street, really. Um, but how far do we go to find home? You know, for Arteaga kind of struggling, um, you know, he finds himself in Sligo, living in an author's house and making sense of himself and his place in this world by walking on the sands in Sligo. Well, thanks to my friends, I, I found home here. The coastline. My last few days here, I went with Mark Power and his family, and they drove me around that sleighhead drive in Dingle. And I couldn't believe, looking out, this is the picture on the left. Now, the picture on the right is my home. Chumash land, native California land. And when we're there, sorry I'm getting choked up now because it's emotional, right? It's home, but look how incredibly similar it looks, the landscape. And I, as soon as I put these slides together, I understood what Arteaga meant. I, I got it. It's like, he can be in Sligo and walking on the sand and thinking about Galveston and thinking about 
right? Because there's something about the place and the insistence on location, the insistence on mapping to then find our place in this sense of dislocation, right? And I found myself living that. I didn't know this term when I was here five years ago, but I completely understand it now, right? How far do we go to find, how far away from home do we have to go to find home? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it was all the way in West County, you know, West Limerick, and uh, the Irish coast looking a lot like the California coast that I know so well. And then when we go to Cambria, when we go, I'm like, oh my God, baby, it looks like Ireland, look. And I'm taking photos, and I'm sending photos to these fools right here, like, look at them, like, look, you guys, like, where I'm at, is this Ireland, you know? So it really is, like, it's this beautiful kind of full circle kind of mapping project that I think really, at the end of the day, beyond the national, beyond the kind of national borders, it go, there's something else there. There's the mythical, there's the legendary, there's the pre-colonial, there's all of that that's happening even before the, the, the conquerors come and decide to tell us who we are. So I think I'll end there because then if we have Q&A, <laughs> well, okay, fine. There is a bigger significance to this. So it's not just the literature, but part of my larger project here is sure through the literary, sure through music and Morrissey. Yeah. But I really believe that, you know, thinking through Arteaga and the Chicano, I mean, we have now a bigger context of this interplay, of cultural interplay happening on the level now, on the cultural level. If it's not on the other, if it's not on one hand, uh, the Mexican-Irish non-binary character on the Sex and the City mm -hmm. reboot, because again, why is she Irish-Mexican?